Hello, my name is Lisa Roger from Otimo, and I want to welcome you to the CIO podcast. On this show, we seek to share insights and experiences from the world's leading CIOs and transformation agents. So tune in if you're a CIO or an entrepreneur looking for inspiration. Welcome. All right. Well, welcome, everybody. And today we have on the podcast, Nicole Weaver. And let me tell you a little bit about her. Nicole spent the first half of her career in commercial software development with companies with the likes of Lotus, IBM, AOL, by uh, way of a startup acquisition. Then around 2007, Nicole pivoted into the nonprofit sector and started overseeing operational technology for organizations, including an international development organization, business travel to Congo, anyone, a university, and a large performing arts center, the Kennedy Center. Nicole <laughs> recently joined the Healthcare Financial Management Association, also known as HFMA, uh, as their Chief Technology and Effectiveness Officer, where she has a purple unicorn job overseeing technology, data analytics, and organizational effectiveness. Okay, before we talk about HFMA, what is an, a Chief Technology Effectiveness Officer? Nicole, I, I know everybody's going to want to know what, what yeah, is Yeah, like what on earth is that? <laughs> <laughs> So uh, my role is uh, basically a blend of the traditional CIO role, which is the chief technology piece of it. Uh, I also have this other piece of my responsibility, which is looking across the organization and um, helping them to, uh, through the adoption of technology, better data analytics and or better business process, which as we all know is very tightly tied to the technology systems that we use, increase the efficiency and effectiveness of what we are trying to do. So um, it is a purple unicorn of a job uh, and it was exactly in the sights of what I was looking for. So I was both very excited and very uh, bemused when I saw this advertised. And by the way, I got this job in uh, the most like non-usual way for a C-level job, I saw it on Indeed. Can you believe that? No way. Yes. <laughs> yes, on Indeed. And I'm and just so like, not through like everyone tells you, you get your jobs through your network and through your right. The, right. You applied coldly to yep. an cold, cold. Like here's wow. my resume. Here's what I've done before. And actually. You know, my role at the Kennedy Center, I went there as a CIO, but I became the chief information and strategy officer. So I kind of migrated yeah. into that strategy area where I was leaving the pure technology side of things and helping uh, helping the artistic planning stuff with things like business planning, because that's not part of their curriculum. When you're learning how to administer in the arts, you're not, you know, you're not People don't go into that rut, rut, that line of work because they love spreadsheets and you know financial models. So I had already had that background, and it was exactly it turns out exactly what HFMA were looking for. So boom, perfect fit, and I love it. I love the crossover between you know here's a bunch of capability that data and and technology bring, and oh, I have the you know, the remit of looking at the organization and figuring out how we can be better and more efficient and more effective. So, yeah, I love you know, it. You know, I and I know we're we're riffing right now, but <laughs> I it, it you know, that is what really CIOs, their roles have more. Sure. I mean, if you look at the last 10 years and just, you know, what's happened with the, you know, more progressive CIO roles, that, that is, they, they ought to put that in parentheses anyways, effectiveness officer. Of course, right. Yes. And I think it's, uh, I think it's the more progressive, as you said, the pr more progressive organizations and the more progressive CIOs that are taking that role, whether their, um, you know, their job description includes it or not, uh, because they are, generally linear and structured thinkers that can look at a process and see the gaps and the 
uh, the challenges and flip it around to say, how about if we just tackle this little bit? Uh, and many business leaders, they're good at their business operational piece, but they're not necessarily skilled at looking at a process. You know, when we learn to code, we learn to look at that, right? Right. Um, so, yeah, I think it's a very natural progression, but I do also come across plenty of CIOs that feel like their lane is not that. You know, it's like I take care of the technology stack and that's, you know, anything that business asks me for something crazy, I'm going to go like, roll my eyes, but I'm going to do it. And I was like, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Well, OK. Tell us about the organization you're with now. You know, what are what are they? What's their mission? What what do they yeah. do? Yeah. So um, the Healthcare Financial Management Association is exactly what it sounds like. It is a membership association, a professional association for people who are employed and charged with financial management in healthcare. And our members are um, employed at large hospitals or hospital groups or physician groups. Uh, all across the board in terms of level, right from the CFO of Mayo Clinic down to people who are starting their career in financial management. Um, and, you know, when I first looked at the organization, I was like, hmm, that sounds a little dry. But actually, if you think about it, who can argue that financial management of healthcare doesn't need help? And I work with and I'm learning a lot. I have not worked in the healthcare space before, and I have not worked in a, a professional association before, but I'm learning a lot and learning to think about how payment models uh, really geared towards basically hospitals and doctors get paid when people are sick, not when they're well. So the incentive is on its head. And there's a lot of discussion around how that, uh, you know, the um, compensation for healthcare providers can be turned around so that they're more incented to keep people well and keep people out of care versus this fee for service model that we have right now. So from my initial, you know, impression of working for a healthcare financial association, well, <laughs> it's just <laughs> fascinating. Um, anyway, so that's the Healthcare Financial Management Association. It is somewhat unique uh, in associations, as in we are experiencing pretty massive membership growth. Uh, mm -hmm. And so that's exciting. We're, um, we're also shifting our mission a little bit to be uh, not only membership focused, but also industry focused. So uh, as we know, there's a lot of discussion about how uh, well, maybe we don't all know, but I'm learning that there's a lot of discussion about how payment models might be changing. And therefore, that there's a lot of future change in how financial management and there's a whole area which is called revenue cycle management, which starts when a patient uh, first contacts somebody and goes through the pre-authorization and all the way through to the reimbursement from the insurer, um, how all of that is going to change with these new models. So. Very fascinating, very worthy, I think, uh, mission of trying to make that whole financial management better. And uh, as I said earlier, just a fascinating job. I love it. I love it. Uh, thank you so much for educating all of us on that, because I didn't I I've heard of them, but I wasn't sure what their mission was. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So and I and I know you and I I know even though you're new to both of them, like you are one of those people that just dives in and learns whatever it is and, and that actually attracts you to something so yeah uh, th this is great for you i'm i'm really happy for you all Thank right you. are you ready for <laughs> rapid fire our little ice fire. okay <laughs> okay <laughs> what you get to pick now, again for those watching uh nicole will get two options and and she will pick one without explanation we will rapidly go to the next uh question are you ready I am ready. Here we go. The beach or the mountains? Mountains. On-prem or in the cloud? Cloud. Steak or salmon? Salmon. Printing or cursive? Ooh, cursive. Country or rock? Uh, rock. Unix or Windows? Windows. Dogs or cats? Dogs. Standard or automatic? Standard. Samsung or iPhone? iPhone. Coffee or tea? Coffee. Red or white? Ooh, red. 
summer or winter? Spring. <laughs> oh, you were doing so good. That was not an option. <laughs> summer. <laughs> okay. All right. And lastly, Star Trek or Star Wars? Star oh, Wars. I don't really like you, though. <laughs> oh, my gosh. We might have to edit that later. Uh, just really <laughs> know your audience. Know your audience, Nicole. Okay. All right. So let's get into the heart of it. As you got, as you know, uh, we this year on our podcast, we're really focusing on digital transformation. And everybody's using that term as a, a buzzword and, and every company is going through some kind of digital transformation. Um, but can you talk a little bit from your experience of how does strategy play into that? Um, yeah, and I, I want to just take a moment to uh, to address that term of digital transformation because yeah, I have a little bit of an issue with it. Uh, it's love it. It's talked about as if it's a project uh, and you know, I blame McKinsey. I blame McKinsey for a lot of this stuff where, you know, it's just like, oh, there's this big new thing you need to learn about, you need to know, we're experts, we can help you. Um, and that's not a thing against McKinsey, that's their business model, that's what they have right. to do. Right. They are their consultants. We love McKinsey. Companies. We love McKinsey. Uh, they're very smart people. But I don't think that digital transformation is anything that we haven't been doing since the beginning of time. You know, if you think about moving from the office memo into email, that was digital transformation. If you think about <clears throat> stopping using paper ledgers and starting to use an ERP, that was digital transformation. Yep. We're just, I think, accelerating it and um, and continuing it. And there are more and more technologies and enabling technologies that are coming to maturity that can really help us. Uh, but I don't see it as something different and new. So to go back to your question uh, about how does it fit with, with the corporate strategy, it's inseparable because in most organizations, if you're developing software, that might be an exception, but uh, in most organizations, IT is an enabling function, not a driving function. In HFMA, we have this diagram that we use to explain the organization and, and we have vertical bars on the top, which is all the all the things that we do because we are HFMA. And that includes uh, the membership, it includes education, it includes events, it includes um, editorial and content, it includes uh, legislative councils, all of those things that we do because we are who we are. And then on the bottom, we have these horizontal bars that are sales and marketing and sponsorship and IT and HR and those kind of things that we do because we want to do these things on the top. So from that perspective, the things on the top are the corporate strategy and cannot be separated from the technology strategy, which has the digital transformation embedded in it. And so, I feel like that was a sort of answer to what you No, no, no. It, it, I mean, it, it, where my next, you know, kind of question fits in there then, and, it, and it's key, is so when creation of strategy is happening, mm -hmm. um, not just purely execution, but creation, you know, this, your CIO needs to be at the table. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's, it's, I know this is an overused word, but it's a partnership because the CIO brings the knowledge uh, and, you know, a little of, of pre-digested analysis of where technologies are and how mature they are, what they can and can't do for us. And the second part is often ignored, like what they can't do for us. Uh, and that has to be part of the conversation around what are we going to try to achieve, which is basically your, your strategic conversation. Like, what are we trying to do? What are we, where are we trying to go as an organization? How can this technology capability or any other capability for that matter, but in our, in our world, the technology capability, how can that help us to get there? And therefore the corporate strategy encompasses both of those things. So I don't think that they're separate. Um, mm -hmm. I think that they're, you know, part, part and parcel of the same thing. Awesome. Perfect answer. So let's go in the way back machine or maybe not so way back. And I want you to think of like one of the hairiest transformations that 
you had to put your hands around mm -hmm. what what was the biggest challenge or what was or a series of challenges that made it big and hairy and and difficult uh so one of the transformations it wasn't particularly big but it was hairy and challenging uh was when we went to digital ticketing at the kennedy center mm. and there was a few things that made it uh hairy one of which was that we had a unionized box office so we had uh kind of a built-in uh barrier to change uh and we had you know certain work agreements um and you know i'm not against unions i think they're a fantastic vehicle for equity and fairness and everything but they do tend to favor the status quo versus change right. um so we had that aspect of it and then we had a pretty enormous user base to educate on how these things were different and uh one of the um, key reasons that we wanted to go to digital ticketing was that it um, it helps to reduce the um, you know the scalper activity, right. the fake tickets, which yeah. you know those tickets all end up hitting the bottom line of the Kennedy Center because even if a ticket is fake, we would honor it uh, if it was bought in good faith. So um, it helps to get around that, and uh, obviously it gives us efficiencies. So. That was one of those situations where most of the benefits accrued to the Kennedy Center, not the user. Like they were fine with the paper tickets. They were fine with the old way. They had to adapt and learn something different. And a lot of the Kennedy Center patrons are on the older end and maybe not quite so um, ready to adapt new technologies especially if they don't see it as better so it was it was a a pretty big deal um we did get through it eventually but there were some bumps that's a very unique example yes uh, you have the <laughs> element of um mainly when i ask that question I, the response is around people something mm -hmm. to do with people and yours was no different but very different uh and that you had the complexity of dealing with the union um and uh dealing with generational you know learning styles and uh habits oh my goodness that that i can only imagine i have to ask um when you were working with the union is it like working with a customer or how i mean did you have a, an, a liaison what did that tell me a little bit more yeah, so there are liaisons. There are shop stewards um, that uh, uh, do agree, like negotiations and agreements. Um, one of the uh, aspects of working with the unionized workforce, which again, I am not against unions. Mm -hmm. I am pro unions, but uh, we tend to have agreements that are maybe multi year, and it's very hard to, to kind of change midstream. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a key aspect of that whole change exercise, uh, as we know, you know, one of the key uh, things about managing a change successfully is selling the benefit of the change up front. So like, right. it's going to be hard. It's going to be better on the other side. And um, as I said, those two aspects in the case of this change were separated. So the benefits accrued to the Kennedy Center the changes really impacted the box office staff and they did not get the benefits. They, they were no better off with digital ticketing mm -hmm. and the users, the customers, they were no better off particularly, or they felt they were no better off uh, with digital ticketing. And yeah, they were bearing the brunt of the impact. So it was a very uh, different change management exercise in that respect. That, yeah, I can see that being difficult. Let's well, and let's talk uh, more about that specific example. In that case, it would have been critical for support on the Kennedy Center side for the entire organization. Yes, mm -hmm. I mean, all the all the all your leaders had to buy in and play a role. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So obviously, we had to have um, good communications out to the customers that this change is coming and and uh it's not scary and you're still gonna get your seed and 
you know, one of the one of the um, aspects of this, and you may have seen this when you buy tickets, is that uh, the actual ticket doesn't show up until like if you buy a ticket to Hamilton six months in advance, you don't get a ticket immediately. You have something in your account that says you have a ticket, don't worry, but you don't yeah. have a barcode. You don't have anything you can print out at that point because if you did, then the scalpers have something to copy and blah blah blah. So, um, so it was very different. It was, uh, uh, it was a little bit unnerving for people. They'd laid down their money and they didn't seem to have a ticket in the way that they were used to. Yeah. So it's like, did something go wrong? So we had to prepare for uh, customer service calls and how how people could reassure people that were, you know, if you if you feel like you've just lost some money, in some cases, a couple of hundred dollars. Yeah, you're not calm necessarily. You're like, well, yeah. what did you do? No, you're uh, not. So, so yes, we had to have buy-in from that. We had to have buy-in, as we, I said, from the the box office people. We had to have buy-in from the people who were doing the uh, the uh, website and making the the ticket supported. So yeah, it was it was a pretty wide-reaching. Yeah, that was a hairy one. Good example. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, they're all hairy in their own way, right? True. <laughs> True. That one. That one's a pretty good one, though. I gotta say. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's shift and talk a little bit, a uh, little bit deeper, more on technology stack. Um, can you share like key technologies that have played a pivotal role in either your strategy or, you know, an experience or a challenge that you've had? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's a few. Uh, I think the everything is a service. I mean, I know that I know that's not one technology, but it's right. you know your software as a service, your infrastructure as a service, your security as a service, your help desk as a service. I've even had DBA as a service. You know, everything as a service really starts to push you to think differently about what you need on your team. You know, what are the key skills? To your point earlier, they're shifting towards business. Uh, understanding business process analysis, bridging that gap between technology and business and overseeing external vendors, which are slightly different roles than maybe we had 10 or 12 years ago uh, on our teams. Um, I think it's the right decision. I think it's, um, but that is definitely a key technology area that uh, has really turned things upside down. Um, secondly, I would say the data environments. So the, you know, the AWS, mm -hmm. Azure, Google Cloud, not just for storage, but for the machine learning environments that make it easy to just experiment and, oh, hey, I'll try a, you know, a boosted tree algorithm to see what that gives me. Oh, that didn't do it very well. I'll try something else instead. Um, I think that's opened up a lot of um, access to that machine learning uh, discipline without having a degree in statistics, <laughs> uh, you know, you can get in there and you can start really understanding what it can and again, can't do for you. So well, I think I that's I, a huge one. I knew you and I couldn't get off this podcast without you talking about data. I know. Um, and I think, you know, the elephant in the room is AI. Right. Mm -hmm. Everybody's talking about AI. I kind of feel about AI the same way as I feel about digital transformation, though, because we've had AI for a long time in different forms. And what happened a little over a year ago with ChatGPT is that the output became a lot more visible to us. Yes. So, you know, if you think back, the first autocomplete or autocorrect is AI. It's a predictive model yep. that says you're probably gonna you probably meant that word and even further back remember the little paperclip guy yes <laughs> what was his name boing boingo or what was that? i don't know but you know what i'm talking about it had a weird name right yeah um but that was trying to figure out what you were trying to do and right. you know i was just like oh wait you don't know what i'm trying to do but uh but that was an early form of ai so i think it's become a lot more um sophisticated obviously the processing power of being able to crunch large amounts of data and the availability of large amounts of data if you're talking about the you know the learning uh, sets of data that is the entire internet right that's become that's propelled it but it's not new so ai i think is something that is uh 
I read something on on LinkedIn yesterday that made me chuckle. It's uh, it said AI is the corporate Ozempic. You know, it's the answer to everything. You know that diet drug. <laughs> no. Um, but I I think that's going to be another one of these just really transformational technologies that CIOs need need to really figure out how to how to grapple with it. And by that, I mean, it's going to show up in all kinds of ways, right? It's going to show up in, in uh, business applications. So maybe ADP is now going to say, oh, you know, Lisa's a flight right. risk. Okay, that's an AI application. Or, you know, in your, in your finance system, maybe you'll say like, you know, this vendor is likely to be, um, I don't know, slow to pay or whatever. Right. You can have those things built in, which maybe you don't need to do much about, but you should really understand, somebody in the organization should understand how to make sure it's telling you the right stuff. Um, yeah. And then there's the, you know, the co-pilots and the, the chat GPTs that uh, people are able to use for themselves. And I think, I think the governance around that is twofold to make sure that people are trained enough to know how to use them effectively uh, and to make sure that they are trained enough to know and to double check what the results are. And I am very worried, like I, I occupy this weird um, conflicted space between being excited about data and insights and technology and being horrified about uh, what it could do. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, we know that predictive models replicate past biases. And I just think as the as the access to AI becomes democratized, we really need to figure out how we're going to stop that, those harmful effects from being proliferated while still managing to garner the, uh, the advantages of using it. Or amplified, you know? Yes, right, 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 yes. Yeah, so, what we're talking about here is an example of disruption um, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, we're, and again, change. How do you prepare yourself for the unknown or for the next shoe to fall? What, what do you do, Nicole, to like stay nimble? Yeah. Um, well, I think I have a natural uh, advantage in that I'm pretty curious by nature. So um, I think it was I don't know, probably like 10 years ago, I got curious about this whole, you know, they're talking about machine learning. Well, how exactly does a machine learn? That doesn't make any sense to me. So I, you know, I signed myself up some classes and we have great resources like Coursera edX, you know, where we can learn pretty much for free. Um, and I think that's one of, one of the things we've already always talked about continuous learning, but that generally meant, do you know what the next version of office does or do you understand these things i think that's accelerating so staying on top of it and being curious and being willing to you know feel like an idiot because you don't know you don't know you don't know this stuff it's like oh my gosh what is this um that's one thing and then i think the other part is just an attitude where don't get too wedded to to what you put in place i always think the one of the signs of a great cio is being willing to tear down what you built Hmm. You have to be there long enough to do that, right? Yeah, that's... You, do, you do, but too often you see people saying like, no, this is great because I built it. You know, they've got a lot of sweat right. and tears in it. And without having that objective to say it's really past its prime and you really should be ditching it and moving to something else. Oh, that's um, good yeah. You brought up continuous learning and um, how I always like to wrap things up is around giving advice to the next Nicole Weaver who <laughs> wants to be an effectiveness officer one day. You know, what would you tell Nicole um, to do if Nicole is early in her career or his career and wants to, you know, aspire to, to be in your seat? You know, what advice do you have? Um, I think, I think the first piece of advice is, uh, don't be afraid of straying out of your lane. Uh, mm -hmm. I think, you know, ha being a chief technology and effective effectiveness officer is, uh, obviously out of a lane that's been predefined. 
So uh, don't be afraid of speaking up when you have opinions about things that are not necessarily in your role. You might be told to sit down and be quiet, but you might not. And uh, that's how you get to really learn outside of your existing competence. Um, for myself specifically, I think the younger Nicole was very convinced that other people in the room were smarter than I am. And mm -hmm. so I would tend to sit in, in a room and say, I don't understand why they think that, um, but they must know something I don't. And my, my advice to her now is they may not, you know, just ask right. them. Just ask. <laughs> just ask them, do you know something I don't? Because it might just be a bad idea. You know, that happens. And uh, I always was erring on the side of thinking that there, there was some magical knowledge that I had yet to learn that made that make sense. And the beauty of experience is you can look back and say, no, most of the time they were just, you know, they were just shooting the breeze and it wasn't necessarily a better idea than I had. So be brave. Be brave. I love it. Be brave. Be courageous. That's awesome. Well, be curious. well I've had so much fun with you today. Um, and I hope everybody enjoyed today's podcast. Um, so see you on the flip side. Take care, everybody. Bye.